I'm Adrian Arsenault in London, Ontario. This is a city reeling tonight, along with the entire country. A family out for an evening pandemic walk, like so many other Canadians, targeted and hit by a truck. Four family members from three generations now dead, a nine-year-old boy left without parents. And hate, it seems, is the cause. Why? Why? You were just out for a walk. Tonight, what we know about the attack, the suspect, and why terrorism charges are possible. They were innocent humans that were killed simply because they were Muslim. And yet another Canadian community is forced to confront Islamophobia. We're scared now. We thought this was our home, but now we don't even feel comfortable in our own home. I'm Ian Hannah Mansing. Andrew is away also tonight. Oh, oh, oh. New concerns about the toll of this pandemic. I can't do this any longer unless I get some help with it. The crushing pressure on new mothers. Vaccinations may be ramping up. The vaccination uh, campaign is going more than well. It's going actually excellently. Not so in big parts of the world. I don't get help from any government. I don't, need help. I don't get help from anybody. I am on my own. Why that's cause for worry. This is the national. And this is the scene tonight. A memorial now marks the place where four lives were ended and another absolutely devastated, changed forever. The community here in London is rallying and it is grieving deeply. So we know hate can strike at any time, any place, but that does not diminish the absolute horror when it does happen. And that is what police here in London, Ontario, believe happened last night. A planned, premeditated attack on a Muslim family targeted strictly because of their Islamic faith. Tonight, we will take you through the details of what happened, including how the suspect was arrested and what police say he had with him at the time. And we will get a sense of how people in this community are reacting tonight and coping. So we begin our comprehensive coverage with Magda Gabrasalasa. So, Magda, you know, we've been watching the community turn out here. Uh, I know you've been speaking pe with people throughout the day. What are you hearing from them? Well, people are they're horrified, they're heartbroken, and they're worried. I was talking to a woman who is a friend of the family, a Muslim wo woman, and she was telling me that she now worries for the safety of her community, and it is because of what police say happened here and why. Flowers and skid marks stain the site of a deadly attack. Here is where police say a man motivated by hate ran down a Muslim family just out for a walk. Actually seeing that and hearing about it and being right there is just, it's, it's awful. Paige Martin drove by the scene just after it happened. She saw people performing CPR trying to save lives. But a 74-year-old woman died here. A man and woman in their 40s and a 15-year-old girl were rushed to hospital and died. The lone survivor in hospital with serious injuries tonight, a 9-year-old boy. I have nieces and nephews that are that age. Um, and what, what are they going to do? You know, it's one of those, like, why? Why? It was, they were just out for a walk. A family walk, as was their habit, say those who know them. But last night, police say a man driving a pickup truck purposely jumped the curb and mowed the family down. We believe that this was an intentional act and that the victims of this horrific incident were targeted. We believe the victims were targeted because of their Islamic faith. Police arrested the suspect a short distance later. They say he was wearing a vest that looked like body armor. They wouldn't say why they believe hate was the motive, but that revelation has shaken the community, especially those who know the family. It was a beautiful family, and one of the nicest person. I have ever known. If it, that is true, that's really evil. Like, I can't comprehend how can someone do that. This family friend recalls what happened when she heard the news. It's uh, very, very, very difficult. Everyone is screaming and crying. We leave our country to come to Canada to save, but we are not safe. We are not safe anymore. The mayor of London made it clear an attack on the city's Muslim community is an attack on Let me all. Be clear. This was an act of mass murder 
perpetrated against Muslims, against Londoners, and rooted in unspeakable hatred. And today, people tried to fight that with love, honoring the victims lost and the boy whose life is forever changed. So, Magda, let, let's talk about that little boy for a moment. What is your sense of what the community is trying to do for him? Well, we know that there's been an online campaign to raise funds for the boy, that thousands of dollars have already been raised. And this community is going to continue to come together over the next few days. A, a vigil has been planned for a, a mosque in the community. And of course, this memorial, I'm sure, will continue to grow. grow. No doubt. Magda, thank you very thank much. You. Today. And along with the grief and anger, there is, of course, so much worry for that little boy. Earlier, I spoke with Abdel Fattah Tawakul, a former imam of the London Muslim Mosque. He knows the family and those who love them. Imam, thank you uh, for being with us tonight. And I, I think what so many people want to know right now, is there anything you can tell us about how the little boy is and, and what sort of support is there for him? So the boy had serious uh, injuries. Uh, they're considered as non-life-threatening. Um, so we believe that he will survive and get through this. Um, he does have um, some uh, family supports um, here, uh, and, and we will continue to offer um, whatever that we can um, for, for the boy and, and, and for the uh, extended family um, to get past uh, or to get through this tragedy. Imam, I know you've been speaking with uh, people in the community all day, and, and I'm wondering what is it overwhelmingly that you are hearing from them about how they're feeling right now? Right now, understandably, there are a lot of raw emotions. Um, we, we feel that th this was an attack on, on all of us because this was something, it, it's, it's a hate-motivated murder. And, and this is something that, you know, as Canadians, we, we think that you, this is something that is unfathomable, but we've already experienced, just within the Muslim community, three different incidences over the past few years. You know, in 2017, the Quebec mosque massacre. And then last year in 2020, the, uh, the, the brother who was killed at the IMO. And now four members of the same family that are, are, are killed out of hatred. And so this is something that we need to take a collective stand and to say that, that we will not accept any form of violence based on, on hatred or, or discrimination. And we really need to take concrete steps to stand collectively to say that, that we will not accept any of these actions, neither for ourselves within the Muslim community nor for anyone uh, outside of the Muslim community. It's a collective stance that draws upon our common sense of, of humanity. Imam, as we're standing here, people are bringing flowers. Uh, a number of people have said, what can they do to help? They know people are afraid within the community. So what, what can they do? What, what could you say to them to, to help them know what to do right now? So we acknowledge and, and validate, you know, the, the fears. Um, members within the Muslim community, uh, we've received multiple messages to ask, is it safe for us to, to walk the streets? And we want to be able to provide a sense of, of reassurance that, you know, in general, our community is safe. But we need to take a stance that, that is, is collective. And so if you see or hear of any form of, of discrimination or hatred or racism or bigotry, then we have to call it out and stand against it unequivocally. Imam, thank you very much. We're all thinking of you in your community right now. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So as you heard there, grief and fear are just some of the emotions rippling through this community right now. Joanna Miliotis shows us how Muslims across the entire country are reacting to this moment today. Not again. It's a heartbroken refrain because the news today is horrific and the latest in a painful loop of violence. I don't see why people can't just spread love and have to spread hate and why people can't just live their lives without having to face this sort of discrimination. At the end of the day, our hearts are broken. Our hearts are broken. Our minds are numb, right? We are reminded of the, the worst kind of, um, of situation that can happen to our community. A reminder of a recent history that is dark and ugly. From 2013 to 2019, the National Council of Canadian Muslims tracked more than 300 incidents targeting Muslims, including more than 30 acts of physical violence. The year 2017 stands out, 72 attacks that year alone. 
worst among them, the bloodstained nightmare of the Quebec City mosque shootings. In a community still recovering from the murders of six men there, leaders say today's news pierced their hearts. It's the uh, saddest news that I, I heard uh, this year. Labidi says what happened in his mosque could have been a lesson, should have been a message against hatred. And we should we should work together uh, that that way to uh, to uh, to fight uh, against racism and uh, hate crime. Calls condemning today's violence are mounting, and advocates say police calling the London attack a hate crime helps the fight against it. And we do need our public authorities to tell us and provide us the information, uh, because the fear that vacuum that we all sort of exist in once something like this happens where we don't know what's going on is, is also very dangerous and very frightening. As the shock settles, more questions. The hope is more answers will emerge. While in Toronto, the lights were dimmed to mark a dark day drawing to a close. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. And tonight, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau released a statement on yesterday's attack in a tweet the Prime Minister says he was horrified by the news, called the event an act of hatred. He expressed his support for the boy in hospital and goes on to address the Muslim community, saying, quote, know that we stand with you. Islamophobia has no place in any of our communities. This hate is insidious and despicable, and it must stop. Police have not said much about the suspect in this case. We know his name, and we know what investigators believe motivated him, hate. Thomas Degla with what else they have revealed. 20 years old and from London, the suspect would have known these streets. Local police say Nathaniel Veltman didn't have a criminal record, but had been in contact with police elsewhere before. It was hate that motivated him, investigators say, revealing little else about his background. So far, uh, we don't know of his membership in any uh, specific hate group. The suspect was apprehended Sunday night in this mall parking lot where police say he stopped his truck and was arrested without incident seven kilometers from the scene of the attack. I mean, there's so much online in terms of material that we would consider to be um, extremist or potentially radicalizing. In this case, we have very little information about what the individual accessed. He wore a vest that police describe as appearing like body armor and did not have any known links to the victims. London police say they're also coordinating with the RCMP and considering terrorism charges, though a conviction would require evidence the attack was ideologically driven and meant to intimidate, says this national security expert. So I suspect, um, you know, you're going to need a thorough investigation of this person's motivations before we would potentially see any type of terrorism charges. Not only will the investigation continue at the London address listed on the suspect's charge sheet, but police will scour for online evidence too. So far, CBC News has not found any social media profiles for the accused. Usually a trove of information on a suspect and their potential radicalization, this time offering few clues about the twisted process that may have led to this much loss and suffering. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. And we will have much more from here in London, including a difficult but absolutely necessary conversation about Islamophobia in this country. Until then, Ian, back to you in studio with more of tonight's top stories. And Adrian, we turn to Thunder Bay, where a man who threw a trailer hitch at an Indigenous woman from a moving vehicle was sentenced today. She died later from related complications. Braden Bushby was sentenced to eight years for manslaughter. Cameron McIntosh has the details and the deep emotional impact this case has had on the community. To many, Braden Bushby has come to symbolize the tensions of a community and inadequacies of the justice system. Now, after years of delays, Finally today, he walked into this courthouse to receive a sentence. Eight years minus one month in the death of Barbara Kentner. It feels like some sort of justice. Kentner's sister Connie pleased with the sentence and the judge's acknowledgement of targeting of Indigenous women. I think she did a pretty good job because she actually acknowledged what, what is really going on around here and not even only around here, all over the place. In 2017, Barbara Kentner was walking with another sister. She was struck by this trailer hitch thrown from a passing vehicle. She died five months later. Bushby admitted he threw it, 
At trial, court heard he was out to, quote, yell at hookers. The case highlighted racial tensions in Thunder Bay and focused criticism on the justice system's handling of murdered and missing Indigenous women cases. Thunder Bay haven't uh, traditionally taken complaints seriously. Lawyer Krista Bigcanoe is with Aboriginal Legal Services. We don't see a lot of cases uh, that are hate crimes, but maybe we need to start charging them. Compounding frustration, delays getting to trial, charges downgraded, tensions felt all around. This case and this uh, sentencing was never going to be a, a solution to um, the challenges and the racism that Indigenous people face in our community. Um, no individual case can do that. I received some death threats as a result of defending Mr. Bushby. Um, I was called the uh, racist lawyer, that sort of thing. So will anything change? Kentner's cousin hopes so. I believe it sends a message to other people that, like, um, to think twice before they do something. <laughs> For this case, it may not be the end. While Bushby is in custody, an appeal of his conviction is underway. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. A majority of Parliament voted today in favour of the government dropping court battles related to the care and support services for Indigenous children. We're saying stop fighting Indigenous kids in court and instead hear and listen to the ruling and implement the, the actions called on by the ruling. A motion presented by the NDP passed with support from all parties 271 to 0. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his cabinet abstaining from voting. Also in the motion, a request to move faster to identify and document any unmarked graves at residential schools. Many people in Canada were disappointed yesterday the Pope didn't apologize on behalf of the Catholic Church for what's believed to be the remains of 215 children in Kamloops, B.C. Indigenous leaders aren't giving up on the Vatican, though. As Olivia Stefanovic tells us, they're planning on going there and asking face-to-face. -face. I was taught by nuns up the grade, probably four or five, and they used to whip, whip, whip me right here every time I spoke Ojibwe Soto. The need for a papal apology is personal for David Chartrand. The vice president of the Métis National Council says he can still feel the pain from his time attending a Catholic-run day school. And they'd whip you right here, and it's like like being burnt with, with a match or a lighter. Despite the abuse, Chartrand remains a Catholic and plans to visit the Vatican along with other Indigenous leaders in November to seek a formal apology from Pope Francis. So far, the Pope has not agreed to say sorry to Indigenous children who suffered in Catholic-run Canadian institutions they were forced to attend. My question is, why wouldn't he apologize? Like, isn't the Catholic Church supposed to be about mercy and justice and accountability? Our government continues to call on the Pope to apologize. Those demands echoed by the opposition. It is disappointing that they haven't. And they should be releasing documents. Indigenous leaders are not only seeking records, but also cultural items they say were seized by missionaries. It's a very big part of healing. The National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations says the pandemic delayed planning for the Vatican trip. Now there's a greater push. We've always said there's truth before reconciliation. You know, our missing children have not received the same dignity nor respect in death or in life that every human being deserves. Indigenous leaders are still waiting for a formal apology to visit the Vatican. While they sort out the details with the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, one demand is clear. The Pope must apologize on the territory of the Indigenous children who suffered and died at the Church's hand. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. Nearly 350 professors at Ryerson University have signed a letter demanding the school change its name the day after a statue of Egerton Ryerson was toppled on campus. Ryerson helped create the residential school system. That's led to growing calls in recent years for the statue and the name to be removed. At the now empty base of the statue, a growing tribute to the children who were forced into residential schools. Now let's turn to Canada's COVID-19 story. The numbers continue to look promising as the third wave diminishes. Daily new cases across the country dipped again today, below 2,000 for the fourth straight day. 
Today's count, 1,581. Much of that progress due to accelerating vaccination rates. More than 60% of Canadians have now had one shot. That's one of the highest rates in the world. The percentage of those fully vaccinated remains lower, though, below 8%. Those shots clearly making a big difference, though. Today, Ontario announcing that it's accelerating its reopening plans. And in Quebec, the vaccination effort is now moving into schools, with Montreal finally out of the red zone. Allison Northcott charts the path of reopening across the country. 2,500 fans were allowed into Montreal's Bell Centre for tonight's game. Going to a playoff game live, didn't think it would happen. We flew all the way from Calgary to come watch the game, and... Uh, it's electric, you know, you can feel it on the street. With scores more watching across the province. Some at restaurants like this, open inside for the first time since last fall. The whole city, the whole province, to be closed for eight months and then we open with the playoff, with the nice weather and all that, I think it makes it amazing for us. Gyms in Montreal and other areas also reopened today while the province started giving out doses to teens inside some schools. The vaccination uh, campaign is going more than well. It's going actually excellently. Still, this infectious disease specialist says following public health rules is key. If the people, if most of the people have already gotten their vaccines, the few little cases uh, that may happen at these events are going to be a lot less than if, you know, we didn't get these high vaccination rates. Vaccination rates are also climbing in B.C. and Ontario, so that province is lifting some restrictions ahead of schedule. It means patio dining and the reopening of non-essential retail with limited capacity as of Friday. We see nothing that tells us that we can't open up on Friday in step one because we have been careful and slow. But New Brunswick has fallen short of its vaccination target of 75%, so the loosening of restrictions there is delayed. At 70.3%, and many of you may say, okay, well, that's good enough. It's not good enough if we have an outbreak and then we lose it. In Alberta, Premier Jason Kenney says there's a diminishing demand for first doses and he wants to drive that up. Get the jab so that we can move forward more quickly with the full uh, open for summer plan. In a summer, many hope will be as close to normal as possible. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. CBC News has learned talks about reopening the border are heating up between Ottawa and Washington as officials consider a multi-phase approach to reopening travel between the two countries. The exact date for reopening remains unclear, but several border town mayors say they've been consulted on talks about an approach that would begin with allowing fully vaccinated travelers to cross as early as this summer. We're going to return to our top story, the mass killing in London, Ontario. The country is reeling after three generations of one family were killed in a single attack. Police say targeted because of their faith. I can't comprehend how can someone do this. Ahead, more from London as we continue the difficult conversation about Islamophobia in Canada. Plus, the pandemic puts new pressures on new moms. I can't do this any longer unless I get some help with it. And while more Canadians get their COVID vaccines, it is a much different story in other parts of the world. I don't get help from any government. I don't get help from anybody. I am on my own. Why that should concern us all. We're back in two. Welcome back. A major development tonight in the ongoing battle between protesters and loggers over old growth forest on Vancouver Island. After more than 170 arrests and weeks of tension, tonight a sign some logging could stop. Here's Greg Rasmussen. And your portion of the document. The stroke of a pen may halt one of the largest conservation battles in recent years. Three First Nations issued a directive calling for a two-year deferral on old growth logging in their traditional territory on Vancouver Island. It's very significant. We want to you know, manage our resources in a way that's acceptable to our people. And, and it's time that we started exercising our, our, our jurisdiction. Those First Nations had initially agreed to the logging, but now say it's time for fresh consultations. At stake, the Ferry Creek watershed, which holds some of the last old growth trees on Vancouver Island. The province had granted forestry company Teal Jones permission to start logging its northern edges. 
Since losing a court battle, old growth logging opponents have been doing their best to stop the chainsaws, creating complex obstacles for the RCMP to remove, even cementing themselves into tubes stuck into the ground. More than 170 people have been arrested. They say trees up to a thousand years old are increasingly rare and vital. According to the Sierra Club, original old growth on Vancouver Island has gone from this to less than 10% of the original forest. It's potentially very good news for Fairy Creek, but we don't know yet. We don't this know longtime activist world. says I, she's right optimistic, but reserving judgment. Again, there's actually blockades and protests in the entire region. So at this point, I think everyone's still waiting for the maps and clarity. That clarity will come from the provincial government. We are working on that and with respect to, and respecting the decisions of the Dididat, the Pachidat and the Hawaiat. If all the parties can agree on a new plan, it could mean a pause in this latest war in the woods. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. When we come back, we return to our top story here in London, Ontario, a city coming to grips with the tragedy. Three generations of one family murdered. Police say they were targeted because of their faith. Next, I speak with the CEO of the National Council of Canadian Muslims about hate in this country and his message to Canada tonight. Welcome back. People are continuing to gather here at the scene of that deadly attack in London, Ontario, after a man driving a pickup truck ran down a family who were just out for an evening walk. Police say they were targeted because of their Muslim faith. Sending Muslims here and across this entire country, really. We're scared now. We thought this was our home, but now we don't even feel comfortable in our own home. Four family members killed. The lone survivor, just a nine-year-old boy, he is in hospital. So with Canadians, and in particular Muslim Canadians, in shock over the events here in London, I'd like to add Mustafa Farouk to the conversation. He's the CEO of the National Council of Canadian Muslims. Mustafa, th thank you for coming out. I, I know this is the worst of days. And, and I, I just wonder, as you speak with members of the community, what are the questions you are being asked tonight? I think the number one question people are asking us tonight is, how does this keep happening and what do we do next? Uh, people, we've been here before. On January 29, 2017 at the Quebec City Mosque Massacre. We've been here before, at September 12th, 2020, when a man walked onto the IMO Mosque in Toronto, took out a knife and slit the throat of the caretaker who was there, connected to a white supremacist group. We were here a few months ago when someone took an air gun and fired at a Quebec, uh, at a Quebec mosque. This, keeps happening and we don't do anything to make it stop happening and we need to do that and, and what does doing that look like there are so many things that need to happen let's start with the two over 300 over 250 white supremacist groups that are currently mobilizing and active in canada the fact that the three percenters uh that the soldiers of odin that other groups like this exist and have not been dismantled is disgusting and it's even more disgusting when these things keep happening. Uh, we need to see groups that are actively mobilizing as Islamophobic there. We need to see accountability from groups, from politicians, from media outlets who continue to spew nonsense and xenophobic diatribes that try to divide Canadians apart. You know, as, as we've been standing here tonight and people have been coming and going, you see all sorts of people and, and, and I, I I know there are Muslims and non-Muslims here, but, but what do non-Muslims in this country not get about your experience? I don't think people understand how much it affects people on a day-to-day -day basis, and I don't think they realize how often it is. Oftentimes, issues that affect the Canadian Muslim community are just not as covered. Uh, so when the IMO incident happened, mm -hmm. when somebody walked on to the IMO mosque and, and killed someone, people just didn't pay attention to it in the same way. But these things have a huge detrimental effect on our community. And most importantly, it makes us and forces us as Canadians to ask ourselves, what are we doing to fight violent Islamophobia and systemic Islamophobia? I mean, we're only a few hours drive away from Quebec where it is illegal for someone who wears a hijab to become a prosecutor, uh, to become a teacher at, uh, at a French school. This is insanity and this needs to change.
as you and I were standing here, a little boy came up to us to say that he wanted to say something, which is that his mom wears a hijab and his sisters wear hijabs. And are they okay out here? How can anyone be okay? My mom was weeping today because this stuff keeps happening and it needs to stop. Mustafa Farouk, thank you very much. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you. So we will be back here in London with more on this story in a moment, but up next. Humanitarian crisis, I mean, is the worst case scenario for Venezuela. And we, we, we are in the middle of that. Well, Canada has millions of doses of COVID-19 vaccines. Some countries have none. The dire consequences of waiting for a first shot. Next. Inequitable vaccination is a threat to all nations, not just those with the fewest vaccines. A plea today from the World Health Organization to get more vaccines to developing countries. The glaring inequality has created what is described as a two-track pandemic, with Western countries protected and poorer nations still very much exposed. With a steady stream of vaccines coming into Canada, we can sometimes forget how well off we really are. Public data says as of last week, 88% of the people on the planet have not had a single shot. Take a look at the state of vaccinations around the world. The darker the color on the map, the more vaccinated the country. Now see all that white? Those countries are in serious trouble. Tonight, the warning for all of us from three of those nations. We begin in Venezuela. Begging for vaccines in Caracas with no idea of who is listening. Family members collecting the dead themselves with no idea of who's actually counting those lost. Infectious diseases specialist Dr. Julio Castro says his fellow Venezuelans feel alone now, unable to trust either the numbers or the plan. So we are doing a kind of unofficial surveillance system, which taking count 20, uh, 40 of the bigger hospitals in Venezuela. And the numbers are quite different from the, from the official numbers. Help is not coming fast. Venezuela rejected offers of AstraZeneca vaccines from COVAX. It may get some mRNA vaccines from the group in July. The United States has excluded Venezuela from its vaccination donations for now, citing a lack of transparency about how the country has handled COVID. And deals made with Russian and Chinese firms haven't seen promised deliveries arrive in sufficient numbers. The black market, though, is surging for those with means, paying up to hundreds of dollars for a shot. This is irregular, this is unethical, and this is dangerous for people. And Dr. Castro worries the once wealthy nation is now so mismanaged it has no resilience to handle either the illness or more economic collapse. Humanitarian crisis I mean, is the worst case scenario for Venezuela. And we, we, we are in the middle of that. Doctors live in the country. This is where COVID's global complications get uglier. For the first year of the pandemic, it was a problem for wealthier countries, perhaps because they tend to have older populations. But something happened a few weeks ago in May. On a single day, the pandemic flipped. With vaccines available for the rich, the death rates in higher and middle-income countries dropped below those in lower-income countries for the very first time. The poorest nations with the youngest populations and the weakest infrastructure now see the most death and illness. COVID has officially turned its sights on the global poor. Mark that day on the calendar is the one Achal Prabala in Bangalore, India, really started to panic. And I find that this is more terrifying in a way because what it means is uh, when poor countries are left to themselves for a disease that primarily affects them, it will mean that they will be worse off and have less resources uh, to deal with that. He's a global campaigner for access to medicine and says as wealthy countries see their dangers diminish and plan reopening, they forget the promise of we're all in this together. India didn't see huge loss until a few months ago. Now, nearly 350,000 are dead and the healthcare system is in crisis. Okay, you can go in. 
The day our cameras were there, Prabala was supposed to get his second shot, but the clinic ran out. And there's the enormous ironic problem. The country that's the world's largest vaccine manufacturer is short on vaccines. Barely 3% of its 1.3 billion people have been inoculated. Why do we have a vaccine shortage? The Indian government did really nothing to prepare itself for the pandemic. Uh, when the first phase of the pandemic passed, they invested nothing for the bulk of the year of the pandemic in any vaccine development efforts in this country. India's Serum Institute did have COVAX contracts to supply 92 of the world's poorest countries with vaccines, enough for 4 billion people relying on that help. Deliveries were slow at first. Then, once the virus started wreaking havoc in India, deliveries stopped totally. And given that these vaccines were being made in our borders, the government had the authority to restrict those exports. Countries that are waiting for vaccines from India Vaccines that are now not coming, what are they going to do? Well, they have decided that they cannot rely on the COVAX facility, which is what promised them uh, these vaccines. So it's failed dismally. And so what they did is to prepare themselves by buying vaccines on their own. One of the problems is that any, any country that woke up late to understanding that it needs a, a large supply of vaccines is now at the back of the queue. Some of those countries now trying to make deals for vaccines really don't have the means to pay for them, like Nigeria. Of its 200 million people, less than 1% are vaccinated. It has among the fewest doctors per capita in the developing world. And so little testing, it looks like there's very little COVID. But the virus shows its cruelties. Nafisada Damu used to work in a bank but lost her job. So did a third of the country. Global COVID lockdowns and low oil prices demolishing the economy. I don't need, I don't get help from any government. I don't need, I don't get help from anybody. I am on my own. No jobs and a creeping sense of feeling unsafe. Surging violence in Nigeria, a side effect of being an unvaccinated and fragile country. There are kidnapping, more kidnapping, more robbery, more killing, more bandit, more boko, and a lot of things. The only trigger that we know right now that, that has led to this is this gross economic, you know, recession that we've experienced. So the sooner we get this pandemic over, the better for the whole world. Edwin Akuria is the Africa director for the One Campaign, a global effort to end poverty. As shocked as he is by what's happening in Nigeria, he is baffled by this country. Look at the number of vaccines per capita each nation has secured. The one that secured more doses per person than any other country in the world is Canada. And it is already vaccinating children. From the outside, this looks dangerously selfish. It may be great for the political landscape, but while you are vaccinating children over the age of 12, just remember that health workers in some low-income country who are also facing this virus every day, do not have access to a vaccine. Remember that as long as this virus remains with them, remains in those places, it continues to mutate. It will come back to your own population in the, in the, in the, in the, in the long run. And then every effort you've made before will be wasted. And if the medical humanitarian argument does not inspire sharing vaccines immediately, maybe an economic one will. Once the virus is ravaging in other places of the earth, everything that Canada needs from those places or that's supposed to be selling to those places will not be there, right? The bulk of the world always feared they'd be left behind and now they see it happening. See politics at play, not cooperation. At the very moment, sharing matters most. So it is in the hands of wealthy countries to decide to what degree they want to lead and protect the rest of the world. We can expect this to dominate conversations as leaders of rich nations meet this weekend at the G7. When we come back, the increasing stress faced by new moms. Imagine being isolated at home and there's literally no one to turn to for support. Raising a new child in lockdown, what help is available? Stay with us.
I'm Jimmy Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Lawrence Wright talks about the plague year, his new unflinching account of the pandemic. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. The pandemic has been long and punishing, but for some new mothers cut off from lines of support, it has been crushing. New research reveals rising levels of sometimes dangerous postpartum depression. Lauren Pelly examines the problem and possible solutions. A crying newborn can feel stressful for any new parent. But after Winnipeg's Abigail Moran had her daughter Eris in March, her anxiety shot up just as Manitoba's COVID-19 cases spiked. The high from being excited about being a mom crashed and the numbers climbed and it was all sort of a snowball. Moran felt isolated on her maternity leave without extended family and friends for support. After a particularly stressful day of running errands with a newborn, she knew she'd hit a breaking point. I was like, okay. I can't do this any longer unless I get some help with it. An Ontario study out today in the Canadian Medical Association Journal found monthly mental health appointments for postpartum moms jumped by 25% throughout much of 2020. Dr. Simone Vigod led that research. We're talking about a, a massive amount of increased need. And she says it's likely postpartum Canadians outside Ontario have been seeking more support as well. I would not be surprised. This doctor agrees it's a countrywide issue. Her team launched an online pandemic pregnancy guide last year. The community exploded as thousands of new parents shared their stories. Imagine being isolated at home, let's say with a colic baby, a baby that's crying all day, and there's literally no one to turn to for support. The study team said healthcare providers need to be more proactive about supporting families who might not have the funds for mental health care or the privacy at home for online appointments. We started to worry about the fact that, you know, much of the care went virtual. Moran did wind up seeing her doctor. She got a prescription for anti-anxiety medication and some new coping strategies to get through the next few months of being a first-time mom in the middle of a pandemic. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, we return to London, Ontario, the scene of so much grief, fear and anger tonight. We'll be right back. The city sign in Toronto lights dim tonight in honour of the family killed in London, Ontario. just of one of many tributes emerging across the country tonight. Signs of solidarity against what police insist was an act of hate. We will survive this test through faith, through love, through our unshakable belief in God and our quest for justice. I read the news this morning and it was just heartbreaking, just absolutely heartbreaking. It was a beautiful family, one of the nicest person I have ever known. I have nieces and nephews that are that age. Um, like, what, what are they going to do? You know, it's one of those, like, why? Why? You know, they were just out for a walk. Hate will never overshadow the light of love. My thoughts are with that family. Um, they'll be with that family for the rest of my life. We are with you every step of the way. That is my message first and foremost to the family. It is also my message to Muslims across London and all of Canada. Adrian, through the evening, we've been watching over your shoulder as people from the community have come to that uh, site, including a couple of uh, young boys. Indeed, uh, two little guys, I would say around 11 or 12 years old, they were sort of waiting politely. And then when we had a moment, they just wanted to talk and just to say that their moms wear the hijab and they're scared. And is it okay for their moms to go out? And are they going to be okay? And the kids have to ask that again in this country. I mean, I think everyone knows it's disgusting. That is the National for June the 7th. Good night.